Welcome to the PowerShell Summit 2021. And I, I got to say, while we can't be together in person, I hope you are well and, you know, so glad that you could take the time to join us. I'm Jason Helmick, a PM on the PowerShell team, and I'm joined today by none other than the legendary rock star, Jim Truer, an original member of the PowerShell team. And we're here to talk about Crescendo. And and Jim, I, you know, I, Crescendo is, is a framework to rapidly develop PowerShell commandlets for native commands. But a lot of people come up to me and say, um, uh, do we even need to still care about native commands? Why are you bothering to do this work? Do we care about native commands? Well, well absolutely. Um, there are thousands and thousands of commands that have been used for literally decades that aren't going to be rewritten in C-sharp or don't necessarily have any other way to provide the behavior that they they produce. So we have to be able to take advantage of, of those commands. And like any good shell, we execute commands pretty well. We Just like any shell like bash or command.exe, you can run a native command in PowerShell. However, there are still room for improvements. You know, and I, I, I think that with with uh, more and more modern native commands, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but with more and more native commands being built today, and we could use kubectl as an example, native commands aren't going away, so I think it's a great position for PowerShell to be in to help people with running and using native commands. And, and so we'll take a look at an agenda here of uh, what we're going to talk about. We're going to uh, talk about why you might want to use Crescendo and, of course, how Crescendo works. And we're going to show you how to set up and build your own uh, native command that has been crescendoed into uh, something that looks more like a PowerShell command. But most importantly, I want to point out that we're also, towards the end here, we're going to talk about our roadmap and where we're going next. We are currently in preview one, and we are very close to preview two. And... Well, you know what? I thought maybe Jim and I could show you some of the work that we're doing for Preview 2 that you might be interested in that first early look. You're going to be the first people to see it. So let's go ahead and get started here and dive right in. And the first thing that I want to dive right into with Crescendo is, well, it's a quick demo because I want to show you what the whole point to this is. So let me take a common use case scenario. I'm going to go over to uh, Windows and, and let, I'm going to use a typical Windows native command that we've all used. Um, IP config. As a matter of fact, I'll run IP config all. Thank you, predictor. Um, and you know, IP config all tells you about your uh, IP configuration that you have on your uh, adapters, your interfaces. And that's a great command. But one of the challenges is, is this is really hard to work with in automation. Like if I wanted to be able to look at the machine's current IP address, maybe I wanted to make a change or something, or I needed to know that information, selecting just the IPv4 address, well, you, got, you know what's going to happen when I try to do this. IP config, well, it helps if I spell it right. But IP config, and I can go select IPv4 address, and it doesn't matter whether I spell it right or not, you know that it's not going to work because this native command is emitting strings, and what we like to have in PowerShell is objects so that we could, can manipulate them. Well, that, that's the idea behind Crescendo. So what if I could quickly take whatever native command I have, like IP config, and turn it into something that looks and feels more like a PowerShell commandlet. I've got a verb, I've got a noun. I can, as you just saw, I've got parameters with get IP config. I use dash all, I can get the dash all. I can also do things like this now. Now I can attempt to select that IPv4 address and now it's going to work because those are objects. And so really that's the idea behind Crescendo is be able to take that native command to be able to quickly turn it into something that feels comfortable to you. Now, what good would this be if you could only do it in one place? Not very. So what we've done is we've made Crescendo so that you can use it. Yep, you got it all the way down to Windows PowerShell 5.1. Take a look, get IP config. Well, here, thank you, predictor. See, works great on Windows PowerShell 5.1. So that means you can use those native commands that you've wrapped for your automation on the existing systems that you have. And one other thing I want to show you, of course, I'll snap up my uh, terminal here on my Mac. Um, of course, 
Now, I'm not going to run get IP config because IP config is not a native command on Mac. And that's one thing you want to keep in mind is that the native commands need to actually work on the platform that you're running them on. In this case, I'm going to run IF config, which is kind of the IP config version. Um, whoops, uh, sorry, that wasn't the commandlet name. It was invoke. I have to remember what I called the commandlet. IF config, there we go. And it'll work. So the idea here is Crescendo works cross-platform. Um, whatever you want to do. Um, Jim, that was just a quick uh, uh, demo into why using Crescendo, but I think uh, this is a chance for folks to see that, you know, native commands do work beautifully in PowerShell. There's always a little bit of room for an improvement, but they work beautifully, but native commands, they can be really confusing. They can have their own syntax. They can have almost their own little mini shells built into them. And I think the idea with Crescendo is, wouldn't it be great if we could make this more PowerShell-like? Like if we could, you know, have clear naming convention, consistent parameters, we can output to objects. That's really one of the biggies there. And it makes it so that, Crescendo should make it so that you could easily publish this and use this in your automation. But, you know, Jim, I think what a lot of people that have experience with PowerShell would say is, well, that's fine and dandy, but I don't have to do that. There are other ways I could do this, right? There's other ways I could wrap native commands. It's absolutely true that you could re-implement uh, any of the any native command if you wanted to. You could rewrite uh, the native command in managed code if you wanted to. Uh, you could rewrite it in script. You could even call web-based APIs. Swagger does a really good job of this. There is, however, some heavy lifting that's involved when you're using uh, these approaches because with Swagger, you're actually elevating APIs to usability. But APIs are different than command line tools. APIs, you have to probably take a number of APIs in order to uh, mimic the behavior of one command. So that means that you've turned uh, an administrative task into a real development task where you have to then use development tools. You have to understand what the APIs are. You have to understand what the APIs do. You have to make sure that you uh, call them correctly. And all of those things really have been worked out in these command line tools. You could wrap the native application in a PowerShell script. And that is in fact what was the uh, inspiration for me to write Crescendo from the, from the very beginning is that I have written being, I have been uh, wrapping native commands in PowerShell for a long, long time. And I thought that the exercise was uh, somewhat tedious in a number of places, and I wanted to try to accelerate that, which is why I came up with the, uh, with the Crescendo uh, module in, in the first place. You can always just use the tool as it is, uh, but then you you lose all of the things that PowerShell is providing, which is things like you know the naming characteristics of verb and noun, and you're and you're having to learn all the specifics uh, about uh, the command, and maybe the help doesn't work the way you think it does, or maybe there is no help, and you can't quite figure out how to use the tool, so you do a bunch of web searches. Uh, to find out what's going on. And Crescendo helps accelerate the wrapping of any native executable by providing a common set of interfaces that you can just write some little JSON and, and take advantage of, of the native tool. You know, I really think that the the the, the points that you, you raise uh, in particular is that, you know, using something like AutoRest is fantastic if you have that level of knowledge to use it. And a lot of our customers, that's not the focus of their of their particular position. And it, and so a lot of customers don't necessarily have that knowledge to to use the APIs directly. But even if you did, you still have a challenge that in a lot of cases, just wrapping the APIs doesn't produce a useful administrative experience and that's one of the challenges. That's why uh, wrapping that original native command that was built with that administrative experience in mind might actually be the best thing. And what I like about Crescendo is because it made it a lot easier to do, I'm now wrapping native commands all the time rather than trying to wrap them in PowerShell or use AutoRest. So a big advantage. Um, wanted to show you a little bit about 
how Crescendo works. And there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, and I'll show you where to, where to grab this. You already know, you can grab this from the gallery, but you need to have the Crescendo module. And I wanna point something out to author. Um, and, and here's the idea, the Crescendo module is gonna help you author a, a well, a Crescendo module. <laughs> in a funny kind of way. So the idea here is that with Microsoft.PowerShell.Crescendo, you can select your native command, you can describe it in a file. We've chosen JSON, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And it's a simple description. You describe it with what What do you want to call it? What, do you, what verb and noun do you want to call it? What do you want to call the parameters? And what do you want the output to look like? And once you describe it, then Crescendo can export that to a module. Now at that point, that's when you're getting over here into the green box. Once the module has been exported, the important thing here is this is just like any other PowerShell module. That means you can use it locally, you can use it in your automation on-prem or in the cloud, you can deploy it, and you can even put it up on the gallery and let other people download it, which is actually one of the things that we hope folks will do to, well, share um, all of the, the things that have been wrapped. So the process is you have this authoring phase. And the, I, the reason that I'm pointing this out separately is, and you're going to see, I have this in the notes for you, to author a PowerShell uh, Crescendo module, you need to be on PowerShell 7.0 or above. However, the modules that you have authored will work all the way down to Windows PowerShell 5.1. So the authoring experience, when you're working on your computer, you need to be on PowerShell 7 or above, but you can use it anywhere is the idea. And now let's start to kind of drill into how do I, if I have this module, where do I get it? And then how do I make this configuration file and how do I export it so that I can wrap my own? I'm going to give you a link to a blog at the end here. And we have it in the blog that you can find on the PowerShell team about Crescendo. Um, we have everything you need to know about getting started with Crescendo. A couple of things that you need is, as I just mentioned, it's on PowerShell 7 or above. You can download this from the gallery, install module, PowerShell Crescendo, and you're ready to go. Now, we do have some limited help. We're working on some additional help during this preview, but we do have an About Crescendo file and some documentation um, available online as well. Now, once those modules, uh, once you uh, uh, are ready to generate this, again, once you generate it, works in PowerShell 7 plus and works down to Windows PowerShell 5.1. But Jim, here's where the fun begins. When we're looking in our declarations, and, and I'm going to ask you to, to, to actually show us one for real, but before we get to a real demonstration of it, just in general, we um, chose JSON to, to, to describe this native command. Um, you know, I get this common question all the time. Why didn't you use PSD1s instead? Or why didn't you just write this in PowerShell? Why did you guys choose JSON? It's actually a pretty simple reason. First and foremost, JSON allows you to schematize your data. PSD1 doesn't have that. So it really was quite difficult uh, to start there because I couldn't make sure that I provide the authoring helping the author. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> There's actually a really, really number of reasons behind this. First and foremost, JSON provides the ability to schematize your data, and I wanted to help with the authoring experience to make sure that we were directing people to provide the right pieces of data to create when they were creating their configuration. There isn't really a good way to do that with uh, PowerShell data files, PSD1 files. Also, with this JSON schema, you can provide tooltips for all of the elements of the um, for the data that you're providing. So that means that I can help the user by explaining what everything is as they are doing their authoring process. So if you're familiar with with uh, using uh, Visual Studio Code, when you hover over uh, an element in a piece of JSON, if it's been, if you have a schema for it, it will provide tooltips if they've been created. And I've made sure that we've created tooltips for all of the elements in the schema and also what's required and what's not required, mandatory. And 
both of those things combined make the authoring process much easier rather than having to have a, a, a document to your, the left to your left side where you look up, what do I need to put here? What do I need to put here? What do I need to put here? I wanted to make sure that we really accelerated the authoring process and made it as easy as possible. One of the one of the other things that I'd also point out is that we're using um, JSON. It's a very simple way to communicate some data. It's just properties and data. And, and the one of the interesting things is it may be possible for us in the future to auto-generate some of these JSONs for modernized native commands. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's something that, it's, it's something where you can author and it's something where we may be able to auto-generate an author. So really it's an extensibility to let anyone and everyone have the flexibility to be able to describe a native command and turn it into something more PowerShell-like. And we wanted to keep it as simple as we possibly could. Um, and just so that everybody knows, um, I've, the screenshot that I have here is of a simple JSON file. And I've also given you, I, I wanted to make sure you had the slides for it. I've given you a slide that gives you some basic definitions of what those components are. But rather than just sit here and talk about this slide, I'd rather have See if Jim could show us an example of one of his JSONs and how he put it together, and then we'll take a look at exporting. So if we could take a look at a fairly simple example, we'll act to to show how this works. Uh, we'll pick I'm I picked the who command on uh, my Mac, which essentially cool. reports on who's. Uh, who's actually logged onto the system. So if I, uh, I'll share my screen so you can see the configuration here. So here's my, my Crescendo uh, configuration. I've chosen a fairly simple Unix application called Who, which just simply reports who's uh, logged onto the system. And as you can see, when you start looking at this, it's a fairly simple thing for me to do. So if you look here, is and if I hover over each one of these uh, elements, you can see that that the verb is the verb of the commandlet. And if I say in 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 uh, and then this is the noun that I'm going to use. This is the original name. This is the actual binary or the native executable that I'm going to run. And then I'm going to have a mapping between the parameters that I want to use from PowerShell and the actual parameters that the tool you provides. This is another sort of way that you can improve the readability of a native command because you may not remember that minus B is boot time. In this particular case, it's pretty straightforward. But this can be very, uh, this can, if you're familiar with native utilities, their parameters are built for brevity and you have to actually kind of know what they mean before you start. With PowerShell, we try very hard to make parameters useful and meaningful just on their own. So in this particular case, what I've said is that boot time is the name of the parameter that I'm going to present as part of the PowerShell command that I'm building, but the original name is minus B. So that way I know what I will call when I finally call the native executable. And I can also provide the switch. And so in this particular, in this particular case, it's a switch parameter, so you don't provide a value with it, but you could make it an int or a string or something else. And I have two of them. I have a boot time switch and I have a, uh, a quiet switch. So these are fully formed words rather than just the letter that is normally the case with, uh, with many uh, native commands. Let me Crescendo. ask you a question, Jim. I, of course. I, I, I get this question, um, and it, it, it's really interesting. So let's say that my native command has 10 different parameters on it, and I, I, I don't care about eight of them. I just, there's only two of them I care about. Do you have to describe every single parameter, even though you only care about two? Like in your example here, you have two described. What if there were eight more? Am I going to get error messages and all that kind of stuff? Absolutely not. And in fact, one of the reasons why I, I like this approach is because I can excise those things that I don't really want to be worried about. So when I type, if I were to try to figure out what, what the command supports, it, for me, it's uh, as a PowerShell command, it's pretty easy. 
there many times uh, some of the native executables will have 20 or even 30 different parameters. Uh, uh, and, and you don't have to describe them. You only have to describe the ones that you want to present to the user to use. So if you think that some of your command parameters, or some of those parameters are never going to be used, they should really never be included in the Crescendo configuration. Well, I was gonna... and, and I, I think though that, that, that this brings up a, a really great point is that you don't have to eat that whole elephant all at, all at once, right? You can, you can look at a command and go, look, I only need two things out of it. You can quickly go in, I, I mean, look at this, you just give it a verb noun and give it those two parameters and you're ready to go. And it, you know, it's one of those things that you could publish and maybe somebody else wants to go in and add in a, a, a couple of more parameters that are useful to them. I think this is a great way to be able to bite, take small bites and iteratively go after, you know, building up functionality. Abs absolutely. And in many cases, uh, you want to reduce the, the surface area of the things you have to know, uh, things that aren't useful or things that are distracting. Uh, you would like to be able to uh, um, kind of occlude from, from use. Remember, you can always just execute the command. That's not what this is about. You can always just do that. The point is, is yeah. what kind of administrative experience do I want to layer on top of this from a PowerShell perspective? Well, you know, I think I, in, in looking at the JSON file, it looks really simple, but I, I, I think a, a lot of folks would kind of think, okay, I just don't believe that it's this easy. And so I do have a slide with some notes on how to export. I'll back announce that slide. Jim, why don't you show us how to take what you have right now and can we export that to a module and actually get just that to work? Absolutely, absolutely. Let me share a different screen. So here's my uh, here's my um, um, my crescendo file. And that's that's the crescendo file. So all I need to do is say export crescendo module. And I give it a module name, which is a path. I'm going to just call it uh, who mod in temp. And then I give it a configuration file. And, and that's the that, name of that JSON, right? That's the name of okay, the JSON. Yeah. So this is what it looks like to export this as a crescendo module. So all I need to do is that. Uh, and obviously, I did this earlier. So I provide a force flag so you can actually force it to do it. And now I've created it. Uh, and we can actually take a look at the WhoMod file. Actually, it's a set of files. There's a PSD1 file and a PSM1 file. So now I can do is I can import this module. And remember that I called this file, remember that I called this function invoke who. So now I can say invoke who. And there's my output. I'm not doing anything fancy with output handlers or anything like that. But remember that I have uh, PowerShell tools. Sorry, invoke who. <laughs> so now you can see that my parameters are uh, what parameters I can use and and what are what what I can run how I can run this. So if I want to try it, invoke who with boot time. That's the boot time. And if I just want quiet, I have that. So I'm actually running the same thing. If I was these are fairly trivial examples, but they should prove the point. They are essentially the same as running who minus b and who minus q, but I can actually know that B means boot time and Q means quiet because I'm able to, I don't have to have a man page. I can look at the PowerShell wrapper for this and know, oh, it's boot time that I want. So I don't have to remember, is it boot time or is it something else? And in, like I said, in this particular case, it's quite trivial, but the point is, is that this can be applied to any native command you wish to wrap. And I think something else I'd like to point out is, 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 is if you notice that when Jim was um, kind of showing you the, the help file, yes, we, there, we, we haven't shown you that in the JSON config, but you can add descriptions for the parameters and add help right in there if you'd like. But you can also add it directly to the exported module. 
And so, you know, Jim, one of the interesting things is, um, can you, you want to take, show everybody what, what the module looks like on the inside, like what you're doing? Sure, of course. <clears throat> so this is what Crescendo builds. It builds, uh, and you're seeing kind of a, a work in, in progress as well. Uh, so there's some things that are not quite yet available, but some things will be. But what's really happening here is Crescendo is building this parameter map, which allows me to map the name of the parameter here, boot time, to its original name. And we track positions. So if you have certain native executables that require uh, a, a particular position in the command line, you can actually assign that. You can, you can, uh, so this is a way that we can construct complicated parameter statements pretty uh, pretty readily. And then also we have our output handlers, which we didn't, in our particular case, have anything, uh, have any done. We didn't write any, but we have um, a way to uh, uh, create them. Also, then following on with that, this entire process block, this is where the hard work of where we map parameters and build values so when I call the native command in the final instance, I can actually construct a, a command line that is going to actually execute everything with all of the maps uh, uh, and the parameters and the output handlers and make sure that the, everything is called appropriately. And then finally down here at the bottom, you'll see the actual working, you'll actually see the working space. This is where I actually call the native command with the appropriate command arguments and then uh, pipe that to whatever handler that I have uh, I have available. And you have two mechanisms whereby you can you can get this data. If you have a lot of data or you have streaming data, Crescendo will uh, enable you to have that uh, data stream. In the case that we're talking about here with who, it's fairly trivial. It doesn't matter, but if you have uh, if you have a long-running process or you want something to stream, we can actually uh, manage that and, and present that information to you. And I think, and I'm going to take the control back over from you for a second, Jim. Um, we haven't spoken much about output handlers, but that's because I'm saving that to the end, and I'll we'll get there in just a second. So let me go back to the slides for a second and kind of catch everybody up on where we were. I, Jim was showing us, um, uh, you know, using the JSON file to declare it, how to export it, a couple of notes on exporting. First of all, I just really want to point out, it's, I think it's that second bullet item there, exported modules do not require the Crescendo module. In other words, Microsoft.PowerShell.Crescendo, you need to author with so that you can do the export with it. Once that module is exported, it's a regular Windows PowerShell, I said Windows PowerShell, it's a regular PowerShell module that works on PowerShell or Windows PowerShell. So you don't need Microsoft.PowerShell.Crescendo on all of those systems that you want to deploy this with. So keep that in mind. It's, it's really simple to be able to deploy it. Now, Jim's already taken us as my slide here, if it would advance, there it goes has already kind of shown you the export and and how, what's, you know, the proxy commandlets that are inside of the module. And you can make modifications there. You can add help there if you wanted to um, for them. But what I really wanted to get to and what I think we, we wanted to spend a little bit of time on is, well, usually we'd call this kind of like a wrap-up slide to our roadmap, but we want to spend a little bit of time here. This, what you've seen so far, is what we've been doing in preview one, which is out and available right now. We've been working on some other previews, and if you go to that GitHub, and I, I'll have some links for you. If you go to that GitHub, you can see that we've got some milestones out there for some additional things that we're working on, things that we've already heard as feedback or some things that we've already thought of that we want to work on. I want to let you know what those things are, but I also want to show you both good things of uh, where we've gotten to and a couple of challenges that we face that we could always use your additional feedback on, output handler being one of them. So first of all, take a look at what we're working on. 
In preview two, we're working on native command elevation. A lot of times you're working with a native command and you need to run it as administrator. Well, I'm not logged in as administrator and that can be a challenge. And I'm gonna stop here, come back here because I, I, I wanna show you this demo. Matter of fact, I'm just gonna show you the demo right now. Let me give you a real world example and then let me have Jim show you where we're, where we're taking this. First of all, uh, let's see. Have you ever had the challenge of where, I'm sure you've had this challenge, you want to test network connectivity, you're having a problem with an app connecting to a server or something uh, remotely, and you want to check connectivity, you want to see if maybe a firewall is blocking a port. So what you'd really like to do is be able to snap off the firewall, do some quick testing, and then snap it back on without messing it all up. Well, that's not necessarily easy to do. Have you used NetSH? Do you like NetSH? NetSH is very powerful, but it's not the easiest command in the world to use. So let me give you an example of, of what I've done here. Um, just as a quick example, set wind firewall. Well, I don't want to set it on. I want to set it off. Uh, not oof, but off. So what I did is I wrapped NetSH so that I could quickly set the firewall off, but you can't. And I'm going to I'm going to break out of this for right now. The reason that you can is take a look at who I am. I'm just a regular user and to be able to flip the firewall requires administrator. Well, this is where we want you to be able to work with elevation and you can already see I've already set this up to use elevation. And we'll show that to you in a second, but I want you to see it actually work. In this case, I'm getting prompted for a username and I'm gonna do that. The reason is, as you'll see, I'm using get credential. Let's see if I can type this right. Uh, company administrator, administrator, I always mess that up. And let me give it a password. In this case, I should get an OK back. And you notice my defender at the bottom of my screen going, hey, man, your, your firewall is turned off. Um, by the way, some of you already know this. There is a There are some uh, network firewall commands like get net firewall. And you can do things with a profile, like select it and, and find out whether it's enabled or not. I just turned it off. However, if you have you played with set net firewall? That command it will let you turn the firewall on and off, but it needs to be elevated, and it doesn't provide you credentials to elevate it. So you're in kind of a catch-22 there. This one, this command that I just wrapped with Crescendo, does. And of course, I can also turn this firewall back on. And again, since it needs elevation, administrator, and I'll give it a password, and it works. And just to prove that it actually worked, you can see that the firewall got turned back on. My point with this is, is that you can work with elevation both in Windows and with Linux. The interesting thing is we wanted to make it also a little extensible on how you worked with elevation. In the example, uh, and I'll, I can show you my example, and I will after Jim is done showing you how he's written his, I'm using get credential. Very simple. You've probably used get credential yourself a lot of times you might want to be able to use some other things like secret management. So in, let me turn it over to Jim for a second, and he can show you the work that we're doing on how you can add elevation to both Windows and Linux and how you can use other things like, well, secrets management. Jim, you want to show them how uh, you did the elevation stuff that we're working on for preview too? Absolutely. So this is the one we were looking at earlier, but here is the here is the configuration for elevating another simple one, who am I, but using secrets management. The the elevation the, the elevation command uh, that I'm using here is a one called invoke Windows native app with elevation. And this is a function that Crescendo uh, provides. Uh, uh, automatically, if you if you use it, then we will make it part of the exported module. And in this particular case, all I'm really doing is I'm pulling the crescendo, the credential out of secret management. And you can see that I'm using a num uh, just a couple of switches, and I also have uh, uh, an output handler that's uh, very very straightforward. So here we have this is the complete. Um, configuration for running that and I can show you what that looks like by exporting uh, by showing you my Windows system I'll do that now 
And as Jim is, is, is bringing up his Windows box to show you this, if you haven't checked out Secret Management, check it out. This is a way where you can have your own credential store and put your secrets in there so that your usernames and passwords, all of it, you know, don't end up in your scripts, right? So one of the ways we wanted to is we wanted to be able to leverage secret management with Crescendo. So we wanted to make sure that it was ready to go for you to be able to use that. So one of the things that I did earlier was uh, I created the uh, Crescendo module on my Macintosh and then just copied the files uh, to my Windows system. And you can see them here. And I can import this module. And I can get the commands from the module. And then I can, then I can invoke this. I'll just get the user. Of course, if I were actually to execute it, not as a script, but as a function, it'd work much better. There so we here go. we go. <laughs> now we can see that I am not, uh, that I am not the administrator. If I uh, just simply run, who am I? I'm James. But I can also get, you know, this is a fairly richer uh, um, uh, example, and I'm actually able to get group information. The interesting thing that's happening here because of my output handler is I can actually change the way I just I format the data. So See, I can the beautiful thing about making objects, man, is that you can now manipulate it. That's yeah, I love it. So th that is uh, using this. Uh, elevator that we're providing as part of Crescendo to uh, uh, execute uh, native executables in an elevated way. Now, one of the challenges here, Jim, is, you know, Windows elevation is, is different than Linux elevation. And so this problem, we now have the ability using things like get credential or secrets management, we can add in that attribute in there to do elevation and we can elevate our native command. Beautiful on Windows. Yep. But what about Linux? What do we do for that? Well, Linux has a different uh, has a different approach. It uses generally uses a program called sudo. And sudo is uh, uh, allows uh, a normal user to elevate for the invocation of a very specific uh, and specified uh, native executable. And we aren't going to uh, do that in Crescendo, but we are going to take advantage of it in Crescendo. So on Linux systems, you can use your elevate command, your command for elevation, you can use sudo. And I actually have an example of that. Oh, cool. In, I was hoping my, you did. <laughs> in one of my uh, uh, configurations here. So let's take a look. One of the things that I that's not too uncommon to do is determine where your time server comes from. So when how do you how do you know what time it is? And there's a time server, and then there's a tool on uh, on my Mac uh, called System Setup. And System Setup actually requires uh, elevation. If you run uh, System Setup without elevation, it simply says you need to be elevated and uh, and it exits. This allows me to, this configuration essentially rewraps system setup minus get work, not, sorry, this rewraps sudo system setup minus get network time server to get time server. So it manages the, the, uh, the elevation for you. And I have already configured my sudoers file so it will uh, not prompt for a password. If you have not set up your sudoers file, you will be prompted uh, with uh, a password prompt, uh, so you uh, can then execute the code that you want. I think that's an important um, uh, point. That if you're a Linux admin, you're 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 perfectly comfortable with this uh, concept already. But for Windows admins that are also managing Linux, maybe you're newer to managing Linux, the idea here for the security is that you set up a sudoers file 
And I, I don't know, Jim, if you wanted to show off yours, but it, it basically tells you what you can execute in that sudoers file. So if you were going to use this for automation, you would have the sudoers file set up so that you weren't password prompted um, prior to this. I can show that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, cool. So here we go. Uh, we're going to take a look at my sudoers file. Oh, no, I don't have permission, so I have to sudo. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right so this is configuration for me and as you can see i've already uh configured my sudoers file so i can actually run uh, sudo id i can run sudo who am i bin rm bin cat which is how i was actually able to to uh, do this uh, without being prompted and then finally system setup get work network time server so that way when i actually elevate um when i actually run my my exported crescendo module which includes uh, this configuration uh, then I can uh, I won't need to be prompted because I've set up my sudoers correctly again if you don't set it up correctly you will simply be prompted but your your code will will absolutely uh, work so if I say export crescendo module and the module name is um, temp time server and then the configuration is uh what is my configuration called get time server get time server and we'll force this in case i did this earlier and now i can then import the module and i can say get time serve and yep. there you have it i know where mine is set now i can also wrap the set time uh server if i wanted to and it works this works much the same way all i do is uh, i would probably in fact uh, in a in a fully configured module i would want to do a number of these uh, get time server set time server that sort of thing but I'm elevating in this particular case, and in uh, in in this case because I haven't actually set my sudoers file to set network time server, I would be prompted for the password. And you know, I think you know, as kind of a little summary, the the the, the moral of this on on elevation is is that we're working on the elevation so that you can elevate on Windows, you can elevate on Linux, Mac, and the idea is is to also give you some extensibility with that. It's not that we're going to hard code you into a certain way to do it. No, you'll be able to use Git credential. You can use secret management. You can use AKV. You can use what you need to use to, to, to manage those credentials. And on Linux, it's the typical way of managing on Linux using the sudoers file. So we wanted everything to allow you to do the elevation cross-platform, but stick with those platform needs and match what um, each platform expected. Um, Jim, I'm going to grab control back from you real quick because there's one other thing I wanted to talk about before we started to wrap this up. And we're, we're close to wrapping this up, folks. Um, but this is where we're at right now is we're working on the elevation. And of course, we want you to, to try this out. We're, we're going to have preview two out soon. And now, what do I mean by soon? Well, the reason I'm hesitating to say anything is that it might be out by the time you see this video. Um, that's how uh, soon we may have it out. So we're, we're shooting for the month of April. Let's see how we do. Um, coming on the heels of that will be preview three. And this is where I just wanted to stop for a second and talk about this. There are some things that we want to work on moving forward, but one of them is the output handler. And if you've been paying close attention, you've noticed I've avoided that conversation um, the entire time that we've been talking about it. And I'm going to just briefly show you why. So I'm going to go over here and talk about the output handling. Um, in some cases, setting up an output handler, in other words, what I'm talking about is taking all those strings and turning them into objects. Well, sometimes that's as simple as almost boilerplate. In other words, it's a single line of just convert a structured output into an object. But a lot of times it's not going to be that simple. And let me show you an example. When I was writing up the IP config stuff, the example that I started this with, 
you can see that I've got get IP config. Here's where I'm calling the original native command, ipconfig.exe. I even put in a description so there's some help information. And you can see the parameters that I did that you saw me use, slash all. I, I didn't use the, the all compartments, but you get the idea. What I hid from everybody, though, and you will see this on the blog, is the output handler. And the output handler here looks, well, I'm just going to say it out loud, Jim, looks like really scary stuff. And what, what happened here was is that, and I'll, I'll just be honest with everybody, I actually started writing this, ran into problems getting it to work, had to call Jim, and he had to help me fix my code. Now, let me just say this out loud. If I have to call an engineer on the PowerShell team to help me fix my code to get this to work, we're not hitting the mark, are we? So we are working on output handling, but it's challenging because you have to take these strings and go, I got to manipulate it into an object. If it's structured data, then it's easy for us to do that with. But when it's not, it's a lot harder. So, Jim, we have some work to do on the output handlers. That's why we we just have more work to do on them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We know that this is not a great uh, a great experience, but but we do know that we can improve things. Uh, and we are approaching a couple of different ways to do that. One is allowing you to just use a script that you may already have to do that, or a function that you may already do have that. We also would like to provide some automatic ways of, of uh, breaking up tabular data or list data. We're, we know that this is an area that needs to be improved. It's also the hardest of the problems because it's arbitrary text, which can really be arbitrary, and finding patterns is sometimes quite difficult. But we are trying, uh, we are going to work on it for sure, because we know that this is uh, one of those things that is going to really help folks uh, take advantage in the best way of, of the, these native executables. Yeah, and I want everybody to keep something in mind that for modern native commands, it's easier in a lot of cases to make a very simple output handler to convert that information into objects. It's when we're looking at older commands or any native command that just produces these blobs of strings that you then have to sit there, use regex, and figure out how you're going to you know, break this stuff apart, that it becomes more challenging. We realize that challenge, and we are working on it, as Jim says. But the, the important uh, thing to this is that as we're working out for the output handler, if it was an easy problem that would have been solved already, it's a hard problem. But we've got some ideas that will help people. But keep in mind the extensibility. Thank you for the feedback that we've gotten already. That's why we're going to let you, if you know how to write an output handler, we're going to let you write one and, and include your own script. If it doesn't require a complicated one, we're going to give you a boilerplate for simple structured data to be able to do it. And if it is complicated, we have a couple of ideas that we're working on. So watch this space as we start to work on it. Now, a couple of other things um, in, in our previews that we're doing. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, we are, and I mentioned this early on when, when we were talking about why we chose JSON, is for a lot of modern commands, some of those modern native commands, they already emit their help and their information in some sort of structured data. They may admit it in XML or they may admit it in JSON. In that case, we can auto-generate this for you in, in, a lot of in a lot of respects. And you can just go in and maybe tweak it for your personal taste. So having JSON means that we have a lot of flexibility and you get the extensibility to be able to write it yourself, or we might be able to auto-generate it. And to circle around, to kind of wrap up this session, first of all, how you can help us, try it. Um, try it out. I know you've got a native command that's got to be a thorn in your side. Why not give this a shot? Take a few minutes and try it and see if it works. Let us know if you run into things that we hadn't thought of. And where can you do that? You can do that on our GitHub. If you take a look at the slide, I can't figure out where the video is going to be for this thing. But come out to our GitHub. Give us some feedback. We also have open discussions in GitHub to start discussions there. If you want to discuss something before we actually make an issue out of it <laughs> and then turn it into a PR, um, we want your feedback. What commands are you trying to run? Are you running into problems with Crescendo? Have you come across scenarios that we haven't thought of? So to kind of summarize all of this, the idea is, is that Crescendo should help you build, take native commands and make them much more PowerShell-like. 
give them verb noun, consistent naming, give them consistent parameter naming, and get objects for output so it's easier for you to use those incredibly powerful native commands in your own automation. And you can do this in Windows, you can do it in Linux, and it works down to Windows PowerShell 5.1. Jim, I think this is pretty cool. I actually am pretty cool. Anything you want to say to everybody before we turn this thing off? Please go use Crescendo and whatever else. <laughs> We really do appreciate all the feedback that we're getting. The discussions are happening, getting a lot of great feedback. We hope that this is actually a useful tool. We think it is. Uh, it certainly has been useful for a, a number of folks, and we're, uh, we're really interested to see how far we can take this. Well, everyone, have an awesome PowerShell Summit 2021. Stay safe, stay healthy, and really look forward to seeing everybody next year group hug group hug and please check out what we're doing with crescendo as we move forward this is going to be cool thanks everyone <laughs>